Welcome back to CBS Sports HQ presented by Enterprise. Some big names that were out there when it came to the wideouts and free agency. Now, all of these guys sticking with their teams. T. Higgins got tagged by the Bengals. The Bucks and Mike Evans agreed to a two-year, $52 million deal. And then Michael Pittman Jr., the Colts, placing the tag on him. The first time they used that franchise tag since 2013. So what does this mean for receivers? in the upcoming draft. We're taking a look at Ryan Wilson's top five wide receivers in the upcoming draft come April. Wide receiver one, Ohio State standout Marvin Harrison Jr. Topping the list, Ryan has him going, I believe, fourth overall in his latest mock to the Arizona Cardinals. Another piece for Kyler Murray. Then we have Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, Brian Thomas Jr., and Keon Coleman rounding out the top five. Speaking of Ryan Wilson, he is with us alongside NFL on CBS's Charles Davis to discuss the wide receiver situation come draft time in April. So when we think about the free agents that were wide receivers, we saw them there. T. Higgins, Michael Pittman Jr., Mike Evans, they are staying put. So Ryan, I'll start with you. How much more demand is there now going to be for receivers in the upcoming draft? Well, Jacqueline, uh, Charles and I just did a, a mock draft on the podcast with our buddy Rick Spielman, and we had five wide receivers go in the first round. No longer going to Tampa Bay because, as you mentioned, Michael Evans uh, is coming back for a few more years, and that makes a ton of sense for the Buccaneers. But there are a lot of other teams that need wide receivers, and this group is so incredibly deep. Now, look, you can get guys late in day two, early day three that are going to help your football team, but at the top, it starts with Marvin Harrison Jr., and then after that, it's a crapshoot because I know that Charles loves Roma Dunze. Malik Neighbors is right there, and I think teams are going to have uh, some tough choices to make, but whoever they end up with, they're going to be happy that they landed. Uh, I don't think this affects the, the first round of wide receivers outside of Tampa Bay because, again, this group is so electric and one of the deepest wide receiver classes in a long time, and that includes that group uh, that Rick drafted where Justin Jefferson went as the fifth wide receiver in that draft class a few years ago. That included CeeDee Lamb and, and Brandon Ayuk. And Ryan, I just thought to myself, when you put together your top five, just how difficult it was. And now I'm seeing a top 10 pop up there. And I'm thinking, how did you get 10? And when you, when you could have had 20 up there as well, that's how difficult it is. All these receivers are a lot of them are in tandem. If you like one above the other, there's no space in between to put a different player. They like touch each other all the way through. That's how good this prop is. And I'm wondering, Ryan, if some of these teams are going to be in their their draft room and say to themselves, I can get a receiver that's very similar to this later. I will fill a different need when a certain draft selection comes up. That's how many receivers there are. I truly believe rounds one through seven, there will be talent there available. All right, so if we think back to last year and some rookie, rookie wide receivers that we saw this past season, like Puka Nakua, Zay Flowers, both guys that were huge role players for their respective offenses. Charles, I'll start with you. Um, how is this going to impact how teams draft receivers when they see guys like Puka Nakua putting up numbers like that? Well, the good teams already know how to do this, Jacqueline. And what I mean by that is Puka Nakua had big-time production at BYU. The reason he went in the fifth round, I think Ryan might be, might be able to shed a little more light on it, so he was hurt every year because he didn't have the durability that people were looking for. In fact, he went to the Senior Bowl, and the one day he was at the Senior Bowl, he was the best player on the field and got hurt, and we didn't see him again. If he doesn't have, have injury history in his career, he's going in the second round at the latest. So this is how this works. The good teams who have done the evaluation, the scouting, understand how to get that value later. And maybe some teams don't see it that way. And guess what? You end up getting Jaden Reed later in the draft that maybe you should have. That's how the impact's going to come about, I believe. Yeah, Pukunuku is a great example, Charles, and you actually talked about this during the NFL Combine coverage last week, and I'm talking about Keon Coleman, who ran a 4.61. He's still only 20 years old, but this is exactly what Charles said during the gauntlet drill, Jacqueline, where we saw uh, Mr. Keon Coleman run faster than anyone else while catching footballs, and you made the point that that means he trusts his hands because he turned on the afterburners, and that goes back to Pukunuku, ran the 4.57, but we saw the clip after he was drafted on day three where Les Snead and Sean McVay said, let's look at his tracking data on the field. He was routinely one of the fastest players on the field. That translated to the to the, to the the NFL. And I think the lesson there is Puka probably should have been a top 30 pick if we're being real with ourselves. And I think teams are not going to sleep on Keon.
Leon Cohen because of the slow 40 time, the 461, they're going to understand that he plays fast and he is built like Puka Nakua and May Jacqueline end up being a better athlete, which is sort of hard to wrap your brain around. Yeah, Keon Coleman right now, he is number five on Ryan's wide receiver ranking. So if we revisit that list, there are some guys on the list that Charles, you specifically wanted to discuss and Ryan already talked about it. You're a big Roma Dunze guy. He comes in at number three on Ryan's list, Charles. Yeah, I think that he put the cherry on top this week, not necessarily with everything in the workout because his workouts were terrific, but that wasn't unexpected. His career, phenomenal. We see it all on tape. But his ability to go to the combine and say, I'm going to do everything and then actually do it, and then stay late because he didn't hit a time he wanted to hit, was upset that that time wasn't there, so I'm going to do it again and again and again. He's the type of young man any team would want to have in their receiver room on their roster and work with, especially since he has the talent to be a big time performer. And Ryan, I know you spoke with Roma Dunze at the Combine and when he talked about his progress from the 2022 season to the 2023 season, he said no one was going to outwork me. And right now you see him going 10th uh, overall in your latest mock to the Jets. How do you think, you know, if he keeps that same mindset, no one's going to outwork me. We saw the progress from 22 to 23. How is he going to plug into that Jets offense right now? That progress was that progress was night and day. Jacqueline from 2022 to 2023. He got more explosive. He was somehow a better contested catch, catcher of the football. We saw that in those clips there. If he's there at 10, that's only because the offensive tackles and quarterbacks get pushed up ahead of him. We saw Malik Neighbors go nine there. And I think Aaron Rodgers and Garrett Wilson will both love the idea of Roma Dunze being there. But something else to keep in mind, and Charles and I talked about this on the podcast with Rick just a few moments ago, if you're the Arizona Cardinals and maybe you do love Marvin Harrison Jr., but you could trade down to seven or eight or nine and let a team get a quarterback, you get the draft capital and you land a Roma Dunze, your team is immeasurably better. Kyler Murray is dealing cartwheels either way. And it just goes to show you, and this is a, a Rickism here, sometimes you need to go back to school to get better. Roma Dunze did that and as the as the kids like to say, made himself a ton of money. A Rickism. I don't know that I've heard that yet, Ryan, but I uh, I appreciate it and that gave me a good <laughs> chuckle. Let's talk about number four on your wide receiver prospect rankings. You have Brian Thomas Jr. and uh, Ryan, you have him going 16th overall in your latest mock to the Bills. And Charles, that is an organization where the fans have been wanting a receiver, but is Thomas Jr. Um, a plug-in guy day one in your opinion? I certainly think so. And and look, very few places, Ryan and I talked about it with Rick, and Ryan had talked about how good Brian Thomas was before we even got to the combine. Then he ran 4-3-3, which became an oversight because it got overlooked because Xavier Worthy ran 4-2-1 in the same group. But guess what? Brian Thomas is 44 pounds heavier, running 4-3-3, which will blow the roof off of anything. Then when you talk with people at LSU, he has almost a photographic memory and gets offenses as soon as they're put up on the board, doesn't have to practice them in order to play certain positions in the game. Then you look at his production, you look at the speed, you look at the size, he's got everything that you're looking for. And here's the kicker, Ryan, I think he's got another level he can get to. I do think his ceiling hasn't been met yet, and I hear that he is trending in the proper direction. And Jacqueline, I, I traded up for him in that mock draft that I did Monday for the post-combine version of it. Uh, had the Bills going up to 16 to get him. Uh, a little sneak peek in the mock draft that we did for the podcast with Charles and Rick. Rick stayed put and Brian Thomas Jr. was still there. And I think the bottom line is that the Bills are going to be looking for a wide receiver. And if Brian Thomas has lasted to the bottom of the first round, you have found yourself a gem. And something else we've discussed, Charles, at length, it feels like at this point, is that this class is so deep. Sometimes you look in, at the bottom of the first round and, and you're trying to find that value and you maybe end up trading down as a team. Their teams are going to be trading back up into the first round to get some of these special talents. And Brian Thomas Jr. somehow got lost in the mix. Uh, and much the same way Justin Jefferson got lost in the mix with J Jamar Chase back in those Joe Burrow days. But if you throw a, a, the ball up in the end zone, this is what's going to happen virtually every single time. It's all over the tape. It translates to the next level. And imagine going from playing with Jaden Daniels, who's going to be a first round pick, to going to play with Josh Allen 
Allen, which is going to even up your game even further. I think this is a perfect fit, and I would love to see it happen uh, April 25th. Yeah, we know the arm Josh Allen has, so him throwing to somebody that runs a 4-3-3 sounds like a pretty good fit. Charles Davis, Ryan Wilson joining us here on HQ talking about the uh, wide receivers in the upcoming draft class. And fellas, we will look forward to your mock draft that is going to be on the latest episode of the With the First Pick podcast. Ryan, Rick, Charles, you can download and listen wherever you find your pods or scan that QR code on your screen.